Thank the Lord. You know, um, his presence is here today, and uh, his presence is here to do what needs done again, like we say. Amen. Well, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. I may be believe he's worthy to be praised. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Well, if you have your Bibles there, let's hold them up here just a minute. And uh, we're going to wave them around a little bit. We're going to make the devil mad and Jesus glad once again. And we're going to say, this is the word of God. This, this is, is the word of God. God. The word is a lamp unto my feet. The word is, is a lamp, lamp unto, unto my feet. feet. And a light unto my path. And the light unto my path. path. I receive the light. I receive, I receive the, the light. light. I believe the word of God. I believe, I believe the word of God. God. Because it is impossible. Because it is impossible. For God to lie. For God to lie. Hallelujah. Well, we believe it. Hallelujah. Now, um, it worked out kind of nicely. I hadn't really intended it this way, but it worked out rather nicely schedule-wise that uh, we would have our communion observance today as opposed to the first Sunday. Now, we'll move our next observance to the second Sunday so we can get back on track. But at any rate, um, we are today talking about a message entitled a teaching entitled, a message entitled, The Memorial Meal. The Memorial Meal. Now, as you know, this coming Monday, tomorrow, is uh, Memorial Day, May 27th. It is a federal holiday here in the United States. It's a day where most companies are closed. Most people are off work tomorrow. That's not, you know, across the board, but for the most part, People are off work, and yet Memorial Day really isn't about an extended weekend. Memorial Day is about, well, a memorial. Amen. It's about a memorial. Now, the day is commonly referred to, maybe less commonly, uh, as Decoration Day. It's a day when families travel to cemeteries to decorate the graves of loved ones who have left this life. Originally, however, Memorial Day was about remembering those who wore our country's uniform and died in service. Amen. As you're throwing those brats and hot dogs and hamburgers or whatever the case is, um, on the grill tomorrow, I want you to think about those who have served our country and who never made it home. That's what Memorial Day really is all about. It is for those who died in service. You know, sometimes children get things a little mixed up. Did you know that? Sometimes children get things a little mixed up. I remember hearing a story about a grandfather and his grandson standing out in the foyer of a church. And on, that, on the wall of that foyer was a plaque that said, Dedicated to those who died in service. Ooh. And the little boy is up there looking at that, and he's standing with his grandfather. With all the innocence of a child, he says to his grandfather, he says, which service did they die in, the morning or the evening? <laughs> you know, kids get things a little mixed up once in a while. But, uh, hey man, but, but Memorial Day is about remembering those who died in service. Two other days honor those who served in the military. Veterans Day honoring all veterans. And a lesser observed day earlier in the month of May Armed Forces Day, honoring those currently serving in the military. According to the dictionary, memorial has the meaning of, number one, serving to preserve the memory of the dead or a past event. Number two, of or involving memory. Number three, something serving as a remembrance. And fourthly, something designed to preserve the memory of a person, event, etc. as a monument or a holiday. 
Now, we're more interested, as should be obvious, what a memorial means in the Bible. The Hebrew word translated memorial is zikron, and it appears 24 times in the King James Version in the Hebrew Bible, 17 of which is translated memorial. And it means a reminder or remembrance. In the New Testament, the Greek word translated memorial is many mosunon, and it only appears three times in the King James Version, but it also means basically a remembrance. So, in reality, whether you're talking about our English language, if you're talking about Old Testament Hebrew, if you're talking about New Testament Greek, uh, when you speak of a memorial, you're talking about a remembrance. Now, I want to bring that around, obviously, to the Lord's Supper, communion. This observance that we do monthly in this local assembly this local expression of the body of Christ was given to us by Jesus to serve as a memorial. That is, to serve to stir our memories and mark a past event that most definitely has present and ongoing implications. And I refer to Jesus giving us his body and shedding his blood for our redemption. Now, the table spread before us today, I want you to think of as a memorial meal. We're going to be looking in these Bibles that we held up a moment ago. We're going to go over here to Matthew's Gospel. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, if you have your Bibles. And I pray that you do. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26. And uh, we're going to start off here with the first two verses initially. Hallelujah. Ready. How is successful? Thank you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Matthew 26. <laughs> Matthew 26, beginning at verse 1. And the Bible says this. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these things that he said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Dropping down to verse 17 of that same opening, the Bible says, now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. Now, there was a tremendous amount of preparation, as there is today, for the Passover Seder table. The lamb had to be roasted, all of the vegetables had to be prepared, all the bitter herbs had to be prepared, the, the place settings and the glasses and the cups and all of that. So he says, where do you want us to prepare for the, for the Passover? So the disciples of Jesus, as we said, had, uh, did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating... He said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, You have said. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broken, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. 
Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Verse 29, but I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's house. Now, Jesus said in those first two verses, he said, it says, when he had finished, rather, all these things. That refers to all the sayings or everything Jesus had said recorded in Matthew chapters 24 and 25. In Matthew 24, we have the great Olivet Discourse. It's Jesus answering the, the disciples' questions when he said there, you see all these beautiful stones of the temple? He said, there will not be one stone left standing upon another that shall not be thrown down. His disciples said, tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy appearing and of the end of the age? Now, Jesus gave this what's known as the, uh, the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24. It's also recorded in, in a different setting. In, uh, it was the same setting in Mark 13, a little bit different setting in Luke 21, but very similar teachings. And Jesus had said all those things in chapter 25 about the wise and foolish virgins and being ready for his coming. And he had told about the judgment of the nations all in Matthew chapters 24 and 25. And when he had finished all of these sayings, he told his disciples, he said, the son of man is going to be betrayed and he'll be crucified. Now he had spoken to his disciples before about being crucified, but this was the first time he revealed that it would be the result of betrayal. The Amplified Bible says this, the Son of Man will be delivered up treacherously to be crucified. The crucifixion and resurrection with all of its implications, spiritual implications, supply the foundation and heart of all that God in Christ has provided for us. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 that it was the gospel. Now these provisions include, all right, number one, justification. That is the act of declaring one righteous or just by being acquitted from sin. The sacrifice of Jesus provided for us justification. Not only that, it provided sanctification, that is, to be made holy or set apart through the atoning work of Christ. Not only that, but it provided for us reconciliation. Oh, I'm so glad to be reconciled to God. I don't know about you, but I'm telling you what, folks. There was a time when we were at, at enmity with God. We were separated from God because of sin. We were not a friend of God. We were in actuality an enemy of God. And yet, through the sacrifice of Jesus, praise God, that wall of separation, not only between Jew and Gentile, but that wall of separation between God and man was forever torn down. Hallelujah. And we are reconciled. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, now watch this. We have exchanged enmity for friendship by Jesus' removal of our sins, thus effectively dealing with the root cause of the enmity. Amen. Not only that, but we have redemption. That is to pay the price whereby something is purchased. That is to deliver from captivity through the paying of a ransom. How many of you know we were in captivity to sin? We were in captivity to Satan. But praise God, the price that Jesus' blood paid. Hallelujah. Now we are redeemed. Glory to God. We can yep. say that we are redeemed. Oh, not only that, but it was it brought propitiation. That comes from an old uh, from a Greek word, rather, involving the Old Testament concept of the mercy seat, having both the idea of payment for sin, that's the sacrifice, and the place of payment, that's the place of mercy. 
Now, I want you to understand here, and we saw this as we read it, but the memorial meal was given in the context of Passover. Yep. Um, Passover, Jesus observed Passover. In fact, during the earthly ministry of Jesus, Jesus observed at least three Passovers with his disciples. It began Passover, that is, on the 14th of Nisan, which has also started the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, originally, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover were two separate festivals. There were two separate feasts. But by the time we get to, to uh, the time of Jesus, praise the Lord, by the time we get to Jesus, those festivals had really uh, come to be observed together, and it was over eight-day period. It commemorated the deliverance from e uh, Jewish slavery in Egypt. Now, the synoptics, which would be Matthew, Mark, and Luke, synoptic gospels, they all record this conversation between Jesus and his disciples about preparing the Passover, which would be Jesus' last, as we said a moment ago in his earthly ministry, Matthew and Mark have the disciples approaching Jesus about preparing the Passover, whereas Luke records Peter and John's question about being in response to Jesus' initiative. Now, to avoid any contradiction, which there is not, the proper sequence must have been that some of Jesus' disciples asked him the question first, and Jesus responded by telling Peter and John to go and prepare the place. Then Peter and John asked where it was that he wanted them to prepare it. As, as we read this, as we read through this narrative, it would appear that the blessing and breaking of the bread uh, and the cup occurred together. When in actuality, between the two, between the two sacraments, Jesus actually would have washed the disciples' feet and prophesied Judas' betrayal between the sacraments of the bread and the wine. Now, I want you to know, and we, of course, say this every time we observe communion. I know that, but I just want to bring it to your remembrance. That's what this is about. Hallelujah. Memorial. And the bread represents Jesus' body. The Bible says that uh, as they ate, that Jesus took bread and he broke it. So that bread represents the body of Christ. And just as Jesus' body was broken, so the bread was broken. Isaiah 52 and, and 14 talks about how uh, and, and the great prophet is prophesying there of Jesus and all of the agony and all the things that he suffered on the cross. And the Bible says that his visage was marred more than any man. The Bible says his form was, was marred more than any man. In other words, he didn't even he didn't even appear human as he hung on that cross. And you know, you, you read about it, and I, I just finished reading through uh, Rick Renner's wonderful book, Paid in Full, and I, I highly recommend it if you get a chance to get a hold of that book ever, Paid in Full by Rick Renner. But uh, in Rick's book, he goes in detail about that last week of Jesus' life. He goes into detail talking about all the things that Jesus suffered and endured. Now, I want to submit to you that even as bad as the beating he took from the Romans was, there was nothing that could have been done to Jesus that could have marred him to the degree, I don't believe, that's talked about in Isaiah prophetically. I want to submit to you that when Jesus took upon himself every sickness, every disease, every deformity, every ailment, and he did that, he, he took upon himself all diseases, all deformities, all ailments of man, he took that on the cross, and as Jesus bore in his, in his precious sinless body all of that 
damnable stuff from hell, all of that disease, when he bore that in his body, it literally twisted and deformed his body. Such a price Jesus paid. Secondly, the cup, the, the wine, the juice, represented his blood. And when Jesus gave that, he said, this is the blood of the New Testament, or as it says in the New King James Version, the New Covenant, it means a contract or an agreement. This is the new contract or agreement or covenant. Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words states that this Greek word, quote, does not in itself contain the idea of joint obligation. Listen to that. It mostly signifies an obligation undertaken by a single person. In other words, in the new covenant, it is not what we can do for God, but what God has done for us. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. It is not about what we can do for God. It is about what God has done for us. I want to talk secondly about the memorial meal rehearsed. We looked at the memorial meal revealed. Let's look at the memorial meal rehearsed. Come over here to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we're going to begin looking at verse 23. Now I want to tell you as we turn to 1 Corinthians 11 starting at verse 23, the context of what Paul is talking about here is he is discussing some errors, some problems that had arisen in the Corinthian church concerning the observance of this memorial meal. Now he begins talking here in verse 23, and he says this, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after saying, saying, a uh, supper saying, pardon me, uh, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Now, Paul was not present when the memorial meal was revealed by Jesus. In other words, he wasn't in that upper room that night with Jesus' disciples. He wasn't there when Jesus took bread and broke it after he had blessed it and said, this is my body. He wasn't there when Jesus took the cup and said, this is the cup of uh, representing my blood. This is the new covenant. He wasn't there when any of that happened. But he says, I received from the Lord that which I have given unto you. I believe that Jesus personally revealed these details to Paul. He received it by direct revelation. Now you will recall perhaps if you have read of Paul's conversion after he was born again in a dramatic encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. The Bible says that Jesus, the risen Christ, uh, confronted Paul on that road and Paul was gloriously and miraculously saved and went to town and, and, uh, and had uh, hands laid on him by Ananias and received his sight and received the Holy Ghost. But, um, but, but, but he also, after that, because of rejection of, uh, that he received, because no one wanted to believe, after all, that the former Saul of Tarsus was now a disciple of Jesus, and so they didn't accept his witness. And so he spent about 14 years after he was saved in the Arabian desert, not conferring with any other disciple, not conferring with any other man, but being in the presence of Jesus and educated, being educated by him by revelation. <laughs> and so during that time, Jesus, I believe, revealed to him what he wrote here to the Corinthians. 
Not only that, but we know that Paul was stoned outside of Lystra, not talking about stoned as they mean it in Colorado, but he was stoned with stones, okay? He was stoned with stones, and the Bible says he was left for dead, and, 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 and most scholars, like I said earlier, believe that he was dead, but uh, he wrote over in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 about how he knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. He said, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, but such an one was caught up to the third heaven into paradise and saw and heard things that really weren't lawful uh, for man to utter, that is, that you cannot place into intelligible speech. Could have been there that he was had it revealed to him what Jesus did in giving the memorial meal. But the point is, Paul said, what I'm giving to you, I got directly from the Lord. Now, I want you to understand something. The power of communion is not in the elements, but in the remembrance. The real power of communion is the power of, of remembrance. Jesus revealed to Paul that we eat the uh, bread and drink the cup as literally a remembrance again. A remembrance again of what? What he, that is Jesus, did for us through his death on the cross. The significance of the Lord's Supper is that it puts us in remembrance of the tremendous price Jesus paid for our salvation. Hallelujah. Amen. The power of communion had been lost in Corinth. The simplicity of communion has been lost in many places today. Yep. Many people get so worked up with the pageantry and the ceremony and the, all of the trappings that sometimes the actual price that Jesus paid is upstaged by communion itself. Oh. But see, here it is. Here it is. We do not want to lose the simplicity of what this memorial meal means. It means Jesus' body was broken. It means Jesus' blood was shed. And it means that was done for us that we could be redeemed. Amen. Amen. Now, I want you to know something. Praise God. It is impossible to put a value on the blood of Jesus. It is the price that was paid for, for the redemption of the whole human race. In fact, the Apostle Peter in his epistle stated that silver and gold, think about silver and gold. If someone were to come to you today and, and, and bring a, a, a whole box of silver and gold or say that I am giving you a deed to a gold mine and all the gold in that mine is yours or all the silver in a silver mine all belongs to you. It's got your name on it. And yet, Peter said, silver and gold could never compare to the precious blood of Christ. You see, we weren't redeemed with corruptible things. See, silver and gold is corruptible. Yep. We weren't redeemed with corruptible things, though, like silver and gold from our vain manner of life. The Bible says we were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. In fact, in the Torah, in Leviticus 17, 11, it says, For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. God has guaranteed, think about this, God has guaranteed by covenant never to remember our sins after we have accepted by faith that the blood of Jesus has covered them. Praise God. The following I want to run over with you real quick is just a partial list of some of the things that the blood of Jesus has accomplished on our behalf. And if you want to get this full list, the uh, notes that we're using today, our teaching notes, are out at Boone Church of God of Prophecy. Um, 
Boone Church, I got a prophecy on Facebook, so you can go out there and I upload the notes all the time. But at any rate, here's that list. Here it is. Number one, it was the price that purchased us from the power of darkness, talking about the blood of Jesus. Not only that, the blood of Jesus justified us before God. It sanctified us. It redeemed us. It brought us near to God. There was a time when we were apart from God, and the Bible says we're brought near, hallelujah, by the blood of Jesus. Not only that, that precious blood purged our consciences. consciences. Not only that, it provided remission and forgiveness of sins. It also gives us boldness to enter into the holies, uh, the holiest rather, God's presence that is. That precious blood cleanses us from all sin and not only that, it overcomes the devil. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, we saw the memorial meal revealed. We saw the memorial meal rehearsed. And now quickly, we need to see the, the memorial meal revisited. Where did it all begin? Well, if you go back to Exodus chapter 12, remember I said that the first communion was uh, established, instituted, if you will, in the context of Passover. So Exodus chapter 12, this is where it all began, folks. Let's look at this, beginning at verse 1 of chapter 12 of Exodus. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. This month later became known. Now originally the Hebrew months were numbered. They weren't named like we, you know, have months that are named. Now on the Hebrew calendar, months have names, but originally... They were numbered. Well, this month later became known on the Hebrew calendar as Nisan. And this was the beginning of the religious or sacred year. The instructions for Passover go all the way to verse 29. We'll focus on these first 14 verses, however. Uh, now watch this. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it unto the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And then they shall take some of the blood and put it on uh, the do two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it. This is how you shall eat it. With a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, so you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and again uh, and, and, and against rather all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting covenant. Well, this is where it all began. Some Passover facts real quickly. Number one, the blood can only be applied to the doorposts of homes where the lamb had been eaten. 
In John 6, 53 through 56, Jesus said, Unless we eat his blood, and eat his flesh rather, and drink his blood, we have no life in us. That is, unless we receive into ourselves by faith the benefits of his broken body and shed blood, we have not received the life of God. Number two, the bitter herbs were symbolic of the hardships they had endured in Egypt that they were being delivered from. And thirdly, they were to eat it according to the instructions that the Lord gave to Moses. They were to eat it ready to go. This was an act of faith. Remember that Paul said, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Can I tell you that we should partake of the elements of the Lord's Supper in hope, expectation, and readiness of the return of the Lord? Hallelujah. Yep. Because not only does the memorial meal look back on what Jesus did, it looks ahead to when he comes again. Hallelujah. Now watch this. The blood was applied to the doorpost and the lintel. That is the top of the door. The sides of the door. But it was not applied to the threshold. Why? Because the blood is not to be trampled on. Yep. The word says. The blood was to be a token, as it says in the King James Version. It was to be a sign, as it says in the New King James Version, upon your houses. This is the Hebrew word oath. Oath. It is a mark, sign, or miracle, token, a signal like a flag, a beacon, or evidence. And he says, listen, and when I see the blood, glory to God, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you. Can I tell you it wasn't enough for the blood to be shed? The blood had to be applied. You know, most people in the world even believe that there was an historical figure by the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And many of those, perhaps, they have had a background in being raised in church when they were young or what have you. And they will say, oh, yes, I believe that Jesus died on the cross. Some of them will even say, oh, yes, I believe that he rose from the dead. But here's the thing. The blood, you can believe that the blood was shed. But you see, the blood has to be applied to your heart and your life by faith. You know, we sing it in that song, but I want to reiterate it. There is tremendous power in the blood of Jesus. I know there are some very well-known Bible teachers. One of them has uh, gone on to be with the Lord. The other one is alive and well in preaching and very well known on uh, television and radio and books and study notes and commentaries and what have you that have gone on record saying that the blood of Jesus was merely symbolic. There's nothing powerful, they would say, in the blood of Jesus. But I want to tell you something. The Bible disagrees with those dear brethren. There is tremendous power, watch this, I'm not stuttering here, there is tremendous power in the blood, B-L-O-O-D, blood of Jesus. Amen. And can I tell you this? Amen. In these last days, we Amen. need a fresh revelation of the blood of Jesus. Here's what the Bible says, Revelation 12, 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Number two, by the word of their testimony. And number three, that they love not their life to the death. There is overcoming, and can I say it this way, protecting power in the blood. Amen. The old timers used to talk about, and you've heard it, I plead the blood. I plead the blood. Well, I want to tell you something. 
One of the things that Joyce Ann and I do around our little kitchen table when we're having our glorious keto coffee, <laughs> one of the things that we do is we open up the Word of God and we begin to pray. We pray for you and the church. We pray for our family. We pray for our president and vice president and leaders and all of that. I think... Joyce Ann even gets those aborigines in Australia in there once in a while, but that's beside the point. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But anyway, we pray. And one of the things that we do over this church and over our family and over our loved ones is we say, in the name of Jesus, we plead the blood of Jesus over them. We believe it. Hallelujah. And I want to tell you, the, the blood needs to be applied today. You need to be praying for your loved ones. You need to be praying for your family. You need to be praying for your friends. You need to be praying for you. I plead the blood of Jesus in the name of Jesus over that situation. And, and, and how is the blood applied today? We're not taking the hyssop and dipping it into the lamb's blood and painting it on our houses. How is the blood applied today? I want to tell you the words of our mouth. The blood of the Lamb, and they said the word of their testimony. I wonder what their testimony was about. I want to submit to you, it was primarily their testimony about the blood. Hmm. Their testimony about the blood. Thank you, Jesus.
time you partake memorial you make as we partake of the elements of the Lord's Supper today may this be a memorial may we make a memorial and remember the tremendous price that was paid for our redemption may we look forward expectantly to the return of the Lord as we proclaim his death in the elements of communion until he comes now um, Going to minister the elements of communion. Uh, David, could you give me assistance here, my brother? Sure. Hallelujah. Now, my brother will minister the element of uh, the bread to one side of the room. I'll, I'll pass the cup, and then we'll switch. And then when we're all served, we'll uh, partake of the elements together. But our Father, we come in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for this time. And we lift it up to you. And Father, we just want to make a memorial in Jesus' name. And look, look forward to the return of the Lord as we partake of these elements. All right, let's pass the elements. Now, the Bible says that uh, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and he said, This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And so we partake together of the element of the broken body of Jesus. Now, On that Passover table were four cups. Most likely, Jesus would have taken the third cup, the cup of blessing, as they communed that night. That cup would have been passed around the table some seven times. And during this uh, Passover observance, they would have, Jesus leading the Passover would have done this. They sang the Hallel Psalms, which are Psalms 113 through 118 as we know them in our Bibles. And uh, we're not going to do that today, but just so you know the context, Jesus said, he, in the, Jesus said he took the cup, and he said, now, this juice, this wine, is, is the new covenant now in my blood. He said, this do is drink you all of it. And he said, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we drink of the element of the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's get our sister.
Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, I just want to encourage, you know, those who may be um, watching us today on live stream or those who may see this service later on uh, YouTube, um, get, get to, you know, a cracker or a piece of unleavened bread or, you know, something that would represent that and some grape juice and partake of these elements with us because Jesus gave this to his body and we want to welcome you as well. Um, to partake with us. Now, also, as we close today, I want to let you know also, and this is again to those who uh, may be watching by live stream, um, we'd love to have you come be with us some Sunday. Uh, we're here on the corner of 21st and Crawford in Boone, and uh, if you're in driving distance and like to come out and see us, we'd love to have you. Our School of the Bible is at 945 morning worship at 1045 and we'd love to have you come out and uh, be a part of that but we do thank you for watching as well well I just say may the Lord bless you and keep you may the Lord lift up his face upon you lift up his countenance upon you may he keep you and may he bless you now we bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit we want to declare over you that you are were blessed coming in and you're blessed going out. Everything that you set your hand to this week in the name of Jesus prospers. Every need that you have is met. And praise God, God gives you opportunities this week to let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You are a witness, and as you go, as we go, uh, may we be a witness for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. 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 Lord bless you. On, on that note, you're dismissed. Yes, you have something? Oh, I thought you were going to preach a second sermon or something. No. All right. <laughs>